The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever shall be great among you shall be your servant, and whoever would be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Good morning. If you uh, ever wonder how my mind works, you may not. You may not want to know. As Harvey said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. My mind said, your commandments are not burdensome. And immediately come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, for I will give you rest. For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, that's how my mind works. It just strings together. And if I ever have trouble remembering where a scripture was, it's because it's jumbled up with all the rest of them up there just running around in my head. But I have had a lot worse things running around in my head, so I don't mind that at all. Let's begin with a prayer. Our God and our Father, we are so grateful to you this morning. We praise you. We lift you up. God, we bless your name. As we seek to serve you, as we seek to follow your will and your commandments as closely as we can, we pray for your blessing as we examine the leadership of the body of your Son here on earth. We pray that as we seek to fulfill all that you have commanded, that we do so in a way that pleases you. Father, we pray that all that we do brings glory to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I guess we've spent a lot of time talking about what elders do or do all day. And today we're going to talk about what elders don't do all day. Um, when Jesus was giving kind of an overview of, of what the, the leadership in his church would look like, he gave a positive and a negative. He said it wouldn't be like the Gentiles, but it would be a servant leadership. It wouldn't be like the world, is what he was saying. It would be a holy system that he would, that he would explain, and, and he did. I guess if the others are qualifications, these are disqualifications. I, I, I don't know, Jesus gave a, a this, not that, and this is the not that part of that. We're again appealing almost exclusively to the words of Jesus. One of the things that, and you can go back and read Titus 1. You can go back and read 1 Timothy 3 on your own. I, I had Benjamin do it last week. I wasn't going to do that again. But we've looked at all of the positive characteristics. We've looked at all the things that, that God has explained that we should be looking for in our leadership. And y'all, really what we should be striving for ourselves. One of the first things that's, that's mentioned to not be is no debauchery. There should be no debauchery. And... and, and I don't know. That's not something that comes up very often, that word, debauchery. But there should be no debauchery. I, I, I did some, I did for some reason lots of Greek word studies this week. I guess I was in the mood. But anyway, I, I dug deeply into that. And the, the best I could come up with is grossly indulgent in wickedness. And well, yeah, God doesn't want that in, in the leadership over the church. Uh, in Luke chapter 11, verse 39, 
It says, but the Lord said to him, speaking of Jesus, now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside of you, you are full of robbery and wickedness. What he's talking about here is they appeared as righteous men. They looked righteous and they were self-righteous, weren't they? But in true righteousness, they, they missed. He said the inside of them was full of everything corrupt, everything evil, everything bad. But on the outside, they looked good. This tells me something about a leader is someone who we should know on the inside. We'd better look beyond that exterior. We'd better know more than what Bible class attendance. I don't know. I don't know what measure we would look at from the outside. But I heard a story one time, and mm, still convicts me. But you know, you you have young children, and, and you're 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 getting ready on a Sunday morning. Have, have any of you experienced that? that fine, pleasant, relaxed, getting ready on a Sunday morning while you're getting your kids ready and, and everyone's just in a wonderful mood and you've had pancakes and bacon and everything is great and you, you all sing all the way to the car and you get in and, and then you just sit there and, and have, have thoughts of holiness all the way from the house to the, to the building, right? Yeah, yeah, y'all know. But after what can be sometimes, and I'm not saying it has to be this way, but what can be sometimes mayhem at the house when your son says, I don't know where my boots are. Um, when your daughter says, I don't think I have any shoes. You know, when, when you're just ready to go and you can't quite, and then you get in the car and, and then the kids are fighting and, and you're, you're getting onto them and you pull up in the parking lot and you get out of the car and you, hi, how are y'all? See, there's a facade that we can present. And I'm not saying that you need to bring all your dirty laundry to the, to, to the fellowship, but... I'm saying that we need to know one another. We need to be in each other's lives and we need to make it beyond the facade. And as we look for a ruler, it, it, we look for, for someone to, to serve as an elder. We need to know what's inside of the cup. We need to know what's, what's in the heart as best we can. Some who, who look clean from the outside are not, so we just better, better know them well. Uh, the second thing is no insubordination. You ever met that person, the problem with authority? They don't want to submit. Tell me to wear a mask and I'll tell you no. Tell me to, to follow the speed limit. I know how fast I can safely drive. Tell me to wear a seat belt. I want to be thrown clear of my car so it can roll over me. Um, you know, there, there's lots of things. There's lots of those examples, but it all comes down to a heart issue. And in Luke chapter, chapter 20, verses 24 and 25, when Jesus was asked a question about whether or not a good Jew should pay taxes. Well, we're not beholden to the Roman government. We are God's holy nation. We have the temple right here. In Luke 20, verse, beginning verse 24, Jesus said, show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar's. And he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. What bears the, the, the likeness of God? Who was created in the likeness of God? It's us. So we bear the like. So we submit. We submit fully. We submit wholly. We submit 
utterly and completely to God. Now, part of that is we also, we also submit to the governing authorities because that's part of submitting to God, according to Romans 13. But we submit, we don't have a problem submitting. Our leaders can't have a problem submitting to God or the next thing you know, they're the head of the church and that's Christ's place. Uh, there was a community that I lived in and there was an elder who, we're just going to say had a high opinion of himself. He kind of ran things with an iron fist and guess what everyone in the community knew? They knew him and they knew that and it reflected badly on the body of Christ. We need to be sure that as we look for leaders and as we appeal to leaders that we see that subordination, we see that submission. Why do you think the Pharisees came to Jesus with that question? They didn't want to pay taxes. They didn't want to be subject to Roman rule, but they were. And Jesus put that all to rest really quickly. They thought that they could trap him, but he said, money? That's Caesar's picture on it. Give it to him. I don't care. But your soul belongs to God. So we need to find leaders who, who get that. They are to be not arrogant, not self-important, not prideful. And we're going to go to John 13 verses 14 and 15, but there are a lot of quotes that would fit in this, anywhere from half the Sermon on the Mount to, 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 to a lot of what he said. But in John chapter 13, beginning in verse 14, it says, if then, if I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I gave you an example that you should also do as I do to you. Mm. That's a quote, but it's a lesson. <laughs> Something that he did. He washed the disciples' feet. He washed Peter's feet, even when Peter told him not to. He washed Peter's feet. He knew and, and had said that Peter was going to deny him three times before the rooster crowed. He knew that Judas was going to be the one who betrayed him in the garden. He knew that the other ten weren't going to fare much better. And he washed their feet that night in, in an abject I'm having a sorry <laughs> he did that what no slave wanted to do for those men those men who would betray him those men who would deny him and he did that and said as I've done to you so you do one another. That means that we are called upon as disciples of Christ to do as he did and our leaders should certainly be free of pride. Not be self-important but to be servants of all as has been read in the scriptures. So not arrogant. Not quarrelsome. Not that guy who's, who's looking for a fight. Peacemakers look to do good. Well, let's see what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6. Luke 6, verses, beginning verse 27. Because Jesus, yes, he said, turn the other cheek. Jesus not only said, but he was a living example, like 
the lack of pride, like the humility. He was a living example of someone who just wasn't looking for a fight. In Luke 6, beginning in verse 27, it says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. It's a peacemaker. It's someone who's not looking for a fight. It's someone who's looking to diffuse fights. It's someone who's, who's a solution, not a problem. And it's someone who understands the love of God. You see, the peacemakers are blessed for they shall be called sons of God. They alone. The peacemakers only shall be called sons of God. So we have that example. We have that command. And our leader should be someone who is not looking for a fight. And also, the next one is closely tied. It's not angry. It's not to be an angry person. You see, an angry person is usually already in a fight that you just don't know that you just joined. But it's going on inside of them. It doesn't have that much to do with you, really. A person who's walking around, who blows up all the time, who's angry all the time, they're not angry with you. And I, I guess some years in law enforcement taught me this better than, than just about any lesson that I learned was that when you're dealing with somebody and they're angry, they're mad because they're being arrested. They're mad because they got caught. They're mad because mama didn't hug them enough. I don't know, but they're mad before you ever got there. So when, you're, when you get involved, it's not about you. They can yell and scream and call you everything but a child of God, and it's fine because it's not about you. They were already in a fight. Ephesians 4.26 gives the command to be angry, but do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your anger. And that is important. Jesus hand, handled his anger in an interesting way in Matthew chapter 3, verse 5. Matthew 3, 5, Jesus is confronted. Jesus is attacked. They're all standing there and they're all waiting to see if he's going to heal somebody on the Sabbath so that they can accuse him. They're ready to pounce. Matthew 3, 5 says, After looking around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their heart, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. So in the face of this attack, in the face of this trap, in the face of everything that he was facing, he did good. That should be our response. That should be who we are as well. Not angry. But if we get angry, we just go on and do good anyway. And that's easy to say, sitting here in this nice, comfortable building on a Sunday morning, surrounded by lovely Christian people. Uh, maybe not on Tuesday afternoon, when you're faced with that person who knows better and does worse and, and seems to take joy in it and does things to irritate and to hurt you and, and enjoys that and is trying to, to trigger you. That's, that's the word now, right? They're not trying to make you angry. Mm. But if you don't already have that fight going on within you, if you have the peace that surpasses all understanding, they can't drag you into that. The next one is to be not drunk. Not one who sits long with the wine. Not given to wine. So, that's clear cut. Next. No. Okay. Matthew 27, verses 33 and 34. It's not a quote. I know it's not a quote. 
but it is an example. See, I, I learned in my master's course, well, I also learned when I was at Sunset, but I, I learned in my master's course that there is command and inference and this is an example. This is the example of Jesus. And in Matthew 27, beginning in verse 33, it says, and when they came to a place cal called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine mixed with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. Now to understand what's going on here, he's been beaten. He's been made to carry this cross as far as he could, and then given a little bit of help, but still. He's been mocked, he's been spat on, he's had crown of thorns shoved down onto his head. He's going to be nailed to this cross and he's going to be lifted up on it and left to die. And they offer him something to numb his senses. They offer him something to give him a little escape. As soon as he tasted it, he refused it. Why? If Jesus' life showed us anything, it was he was never looking for an escape. He was never looking for something to numb his senses. He was always present in the moment, fully aware. I've said before, I'm not sure that when he was seeing people's hearts and understanding their motives and all that, I'm not sure that that's a miraculous thing. I still think that it could have been. He was just paying that close attention. And if we did, we could too. Wine, the bitter herbs, dulls the senses. Well, wine alone. Ethyl alcohol, that's the active ingredient. The body takes one hour to metabolize a glass of wine, a can of beer, or a shot of whiskey. One hour. So what are you in that one hour after you've drunk that? Your body hasn't metabolized it, so it's in your bloodstream. You're dull, you're impaired, you are. Now you say, well, I don't get drunk. Honestly, all we're talking about now is how? Well, I'm not drunk to the legal limit. I've read from Genesis to the map. I haven't found the legal limit in there yet. Not 0.1, not 0.7, not there. We can discuss the amount, but impairment is nearly immediately, and at the very least, it lasts about an hour. And you say, well, what is the harm? Okay, but what is the good? I've seen lives destroyed. I've seen families destroyed. I've seen people killed. I've seen people kill themselves. I have family members who've literally drunk themselves to death. I have seen this and I haven't found the good in alcohol yet. So as we seek a leader, I think we need to seek someone who is not drunk. We could even say to any extent at any time, not impaired not looking to dull the senses, but looking to be present and clear. The next one, number seven if you're counting, it's number seven if you're not, uh, <laughs> is to be not violent, not a striker or a brawler, not that guy who's first, the first thing he goes to is, well, I'll show you. It's not what we need. In Matthew 26, verse 52, when Peter, bless his heart, it's a southern thing, yeah, bless his heart. Peter, who'd been told to get a sword, brought the sword, had the sword, he saw the need to use the sword. And he cut off a man's ear. I still say he wasn't aiming for his ear. But he cut off the man's ear with that sword. 
And in Matthew 26, verse 52, then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. He who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. If returning violence for violence was the way of the Christ, he would have killed thousands before he ever got to his trial. He, yes, we say he could have with a word, but he could have with a thought. But instead, mm, Romans 13, 14 says to bless those who curse you. Bless those who persecute you. Bless those, love your enemy. Oh. Verse 17 boils it all down in Romans 13. It says, never pay back evil for evil. And you see, that's what a striker or a brawler or a violent person is looking to do. It is not get even, but get ahead. That is the beginning of destruction for all. The gangs have codes that they live by. You put one of us, ours in the hospital, we'll put one of yours in the morgue. And then they put two of the others in the morgue. And then they'll go after a half a dozen of the others and put them in the morgue. And a lot of good comes from that, right? See, that's why Jesus is against it. That's why God is against it. And that's why it's in this list of things that we don't need in someone who is leading the church. I have come to be very fond of the be part of the solution, not part of the problem. That is who the man of God is supposed to be in that holds you back from violence. There to be not greedy. First mm, Timothy 6.10 is the, the verse that everybody knows because money is the root of all evil. Except that's not exactly how it reads and that's not exactly what it means. But it does mean that money is the root of all kinds of evil. Jesus put it differently in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 6.24, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And what masters are we talking about specifically? Well, he clarifies that. He says, you cannot serve God and wealth. You can't serve, what is it? God and mammon, right? Well, that sounds better. That's I don't have any mammon on me. And uh, so I don't have to worry about that. No, it's talking about serving wealth. It's talking about loving money. It's talking about the same sin that Jesus talked about more than almost anything else. And so the difficulty of the rich entering the, the, the kingdom of heaven, Mark 10, 25. But Jesus said all things are possible with God in verse 27. So it's not talking about having money. It's talking about greed, specifically. It's talking about that love of money. It's talking about that obsession with money. And greed does not follow any socioeconomic lines. Because someone has money does not mean that they're greedy may mean that they've worked hard, had good ideas, or maybe their parents or grandparents did. But greed is being obsessed with that. And I've known plenty of poor people in my life who were obsessed with money and, and thought that money would solve everything and thought that money was the root of every single bad thing that ever happened to them and everything else. In the leadership of the church, we don't need that. Number nine, number last, not a recent convert. Oh good, what are we talking about? What is recent? Have you met that convert who was converted 30 years ago and spiritually is at the same place that they were 29 and a half years ago? I don't think we need to put a time frame on it, but I, I believe that it has to do with maturity. 
I believe it has to do with spiritual growth that has happened since the time of their conversion. Mark 4.20 says, And those are the ones whom the seed was sown on the good soil. And they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. See, when the seed is sown on good soil, there it produces a mature plant. That plant produces a head. That head produces grain, the fruit. 1st fruit, that's what it's all about. The fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of discipleship, the fruitful service that each of us should be, should be engaged in. Hebrews 5.12 is an indictment. It says, by this time you should be teachers. It talks about milk and meat. And, but you should be teachers by now, and yet you're having to be taught the elementary truths. And it's a condemnation of those people who've not matured. In the leadership of the church, we need those who are mature. In fact, it's so important that when it mentions this, it says that there is a snare by the devil for those who are not mature. It ends badly. It, they lead badly. They lead selfishly. They have motives that are not pure and are not, not Christ-like. So that is, we don't need to set a snare for anyone who's not mature enough. And I know a man and I talked to him and he wrestled with this mightily. He's, he's stepped down now. He was a very young man and he was encouraged, we'll say. He, he felt like it was more uh, to, to step into the place of being an elder. And years down the road, by the time I knew him, I was talking to him and he was still talking about that. And he said, I just don't think I was ready. And, and I'm not even sure I am now. And it had, in a way, it had stunted his maturing because of that guilt and because of the, the, the fear that he had. And, and so it can be a snare and it will end badly for, for that leader. And, and it can for the, for the body as well. So there are fewer knots than do's, it's, it's 14 to 9. But when we look at all these things, this should be things that we're all striving for. It should be what the one who is maturing in Christ should be trying to, to grow into. But we need a leader who has grown into these things already. Um, we need leaders who are faithful followers. We need leaders who are willing to submit, but we all need to be willing to submit. And we better get leaders who are willing to submit to God because we're supposed to submit to them. And I want to follow someone, but I want to follow someone as they follow Christ. That is what we need, and it's what God and His Word delineates. For those of us who, who are not, and those of us who, who may never step into this, this role, we should all be striving for this. We should all be trying to mature into uh, the person of God who, who lives that fruitful life. This morning, if you haven't started your walk, if you haven't established your covenant with God by following Jesus into his death, his burial, and his resurrection and baptism, you can do that this morning. If you need prayers, we can do that this morning. If there's any way that we can help, just come as we stand and sing.